afternoon. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to go ahead and get started tonight. And first off, I want to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us. Um, pretty good number tonight. And um, you're joining us tonight for the Virginia Pumpkin Growers Association's talk on insect control and pollinators in pumpkins. Um, so we've got actually three speakers tonight. Um, we're going to start off with um, Dr. Tom Kuhar. Um, he's an entomologist from Virginia Tech, and I will let him introduce himself and go ahead and get started. Uh, Ashley, I think I'm going to need screen sharing privileges. Sorry, doing that right now. Okay, you should be good. Okay, hopefully. See my title slide up there, everybody? Or anybody, Ashley? <laughs> yes, it looks good. Yes. Okay, all right, very good. Well, thanks for us tonight. Um, I'm gonna, uh, oh, there we go. Mouse was sticking a little bit. I'm gonna re review some things I've talked about at previous, um, Pumpkin meetings, I think a lot of you are familiar with me over the last 10 years. I've, I think I've been talking at um, most of the pumpkin meetings that have been that have been going on. Um, I'm going to try to reinforce some of these points I've made over the time. And I've got some some new insecticide trials that we've done this year. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe discuss at the end um, an important pest that just seems to be uh, really rising up um, and becoming a major headache for us. So whether that's an I or one, but I think many of you are already using this. Um, you may have had a, uh, a talk by Dr. Steve Rideout um, or David Langston on, on plant pathology. And the three of us definitely agree. Um, and James for that matter, because I'm actually going to show some work that James did with this. But I mean, pumpkin growers are very, very fortunate to have um, one heck of a seed treatment that does not cost that much. You can see the cost down in the bottom. Um, and just is really a great way to get your crop a jump start. I mean, it's got three fungicides in there and it's got a neonicotinoid insecticide thiamethoxam. And the beauty of uh, pumpkins is, you know, it's a large seeded crop. And when you put something on On a, on a seed and the plant spacing is so great where you need it to go, which is, which is into that plant. So that's another beauty. Dr. Kuhar, you're beauty freezing pumpkins. It, it kinda, a um, little bit. Fits. I'm sorry, Ashley, I'm you're fading. You're freezing in and out a little bit. So we're missing some of the stuff that you're saying. Okay, boy, I apologize. It must be something going on with the internet. It's normally not a not an issue here at home, but um, so yeah, this is this will get a lot of different diseases. And I'm not a plant pathologist, but these are things that Steve Rideout has mentioned, and things that are actually on the label of it. But what I do know, because I've done these evaluations, is that um, it's going to give you about 21 days of protection against cucumber beetles. Um, and any insects that might vector some of those early diseases like viruses to the to the plant, like cucumber beetles or or aphids. So, you know, one one heck of a way to start um, is with that seed treatment. Some other things that we've seen occasionally is that, especially if it's wet after planting, a wet spring, you can get seed corn maggots that can take out some of the seeds and take out some of the really young seedlings. And that seed treatment's gonna fit when he was a PhD student. And we had looked at some pumpkin farms that 
had treated the far more seed treatment and then they planted a patch where there was no seed treatment. And you can just see that, um, you know, it wasn't severe pressure, but in two of the sites we had significantly better stand of pumpkins. And in all of them, we had numerically um, a higher, higher number of stands. So it's kind of beating a dead horse here, but what a way to start is with this terrific seed treatment that's, that's gonna give you um, protection against insects and a lot of those early, early diseases that could, that could kill the seedling. Some concerns though, because it's a neonicotinoid insecticide or what's, you know, what is that gonna do to these pollinators? What is it gonna, gonna do to bees? And again, because it's a seed treatment, this is probably the best way to go um, if you're gonna try to protect these pollinators because it's just a tiny amount, it's put on the seed. And by the time that those flowers are around, there's just such a teeny tiny amount um, that's in there that, you know, the it's it's probably the best the best scenario for bees is that it, that that insecticide went down on a seed treatment. In fact, there's been some research that's been done at University of Maryland that's published on um, honeybee hives that were fed a sugar water solution that contained neonicotinoid insecticides. Imidacloprid was the the insecticide at various concentrations that they might get from you know the highest possible dose of like seed treated crops and as you can see here there was no effect on the honeybee hives um, they just had um, all all of the variables it didn't matter what they which which rate of these insecticides they all they all pretty much did pretty well um, so that's a good indication that as a seed treatment it it's probably um, relatively safe it's not a hundred percent and there may be some other concerns with neonicotinoids, but if you're going to use them, the seed treatment is probably a good way to go. Um, so you get about 21 days in there and then you could still get some late cucumber beetles coming on the crop. So this is where the decision making comes in. And this is where I'm going to talk about options and things that you might be thinking about. So I'm assuming everyone's going to start with that seed treatment. So here we are about three weeks into it and it's possible to get cucumber beetles coming in and there's your first decision making very likely as cucumber beetles for whether to spray or not. And some of the insecticides that are registered for cucumber beetles, um, there's a lot of pyrethroids and these are all listed in, in blue. You probably recognize one of those products. You've got one in your in your insecticide shed that you're using. Carboreal is an older um, seven, that's an older carbamate, um, but it, it is still actually very effective on cucumber beetles, just um, has some other drawbacks, um, could flare mites and things like that. And then the ones you see in the red are not pyrethroids, but they are insecticides that um, can provide protection against, against cucumber beetles. And we're gonna talk about those, Asale, Savanto, and Arvanta. Um, so, okay, we're about midway into this crop or at least a, a, a month or so um, into it and you've got some decisions to make. The first thing you might wanna think about is do you really need to spray anything? I have, over the last 10 years, I've been around a lot of uh, commercial pumpkin farms around Virginia and it really surprised me the number of growers that just say, I'm, I don't spray insecticides anymore. Um, and they they feel pretty uh, pretty confident that you know they're not really suffering a lot of loss. The one thing that they agreed is that getting cucumber beetles after that plant has gotten some size to it, it just seems to be able to tolerate that pretty well um, without without really harming things. And that's what the research has shown that that plant gets about mid season. It can really really tolerate a lot of defoliation. Um, there are action thresholds. It's about if the plants are really small, the seedlings, it's it's about one beetle per plant, but it's about five beetles per plant when they get some size to them about mid-season. So that's kind of a threshold that you may have enough cucumber beetles there that it makes sense to, to put a spray out. The other thing you need to think about, are you starting to flower? Because although you might find cucumber beetles um, in the flowers, because they certainly love to eat eat the pollen, that is not the time to be spraying cucumber beetles. One, the research has actually shown that 
they do participate in pollination. They're, they're not the greatest pollinators, nowhere near bees, but there's so many of them and they're going in and out of flowers that there is actually some pollination that's provided by these cucumber beetles and very little damage to the crop that's occurring. Um, in fact, they're a lot more interested in the flowers at this point than, than any kind of defoliating that they would do. Um, however, I'm not gonna say that you're in the clear with cucumber beetles. You don't have to worry about them anymore because I've seen them uh, attack the fruit in the field. A lot of times this is when foliage has, has really gone down um, for one reason or another, a lot of times disease. And uh, yeah, you don't wanna lose your fruit at this point to scarring up and, and have it un, unmarketable. And cucumber beetles are definitely one of, the, one of the insects that can get you late. So I know there's some need to control cucumber beetles after, after that mid stage. So um, what you don't wanna do is to just be putting out pyrethroids every week just because pyrethroids are cheap seen this time and time again and i know some folks that are probably on a zoom meeting um, have experienced this and that is these melan melan aphid outbreaks that that can happen late season it's brought on by pyrethroids without a doubt um, you're wiping out the natural enemies and you're just causing these things to just explode um, and that's when you have these explosions on the leaves of just tons of aphids you get the honeydew build up and the sooty mold and again, affects your marketability of your pumpkin. So we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to spray pyrethroids, which are very, very toxic to all these things right here, which are found in pumpkin fields, which eat aphids. Um, they eat a lot of other things too, but they will clean up the aphids and they are all highly sensitive to pyrethroids. So you spray them, you're pretty much going to wipe these guys out. <clears throat> I can show you Tables and tables of data where we've done this. These are in blue, are pyrethroid containing insecticides. And you can see that these are aphid numbers occurring on the pumpkins. Um, or this was actually a squash trial, but it doesn't matter. It just hammers home the point that you're gonna get high aphid numbers when you, when you spray the pyrethroids. So, okay, what are some other options? So maybe fit in one pyrethroid spray is probably not bad, um, especially one that's well-timed. But maybe a suggestion is, particularly if you have flowers out there, you've got a lot of pollinators, is to maybe go with something else. By the way, pyrethroids are very toxic to bees. Um, but you have other products, you have options like a sale, which is, although it's a neonicotinoid, it's about a hundred times less toxic than other neonics. Um, very good insecticide. And Savanto is, is a little bit newer. Um, and it's kind of neonicotinoid-like, a little bit different um, than, than a neonic, but again, very um, much safer to the bees than the other insecticides and other neonicotinoids. So let's take a look at some of these insecticides. We've, we've run them. Here's a trial in 2016. I just put this up because it's a trial where we've got all the late season insects um, came in this trial in 2016 in Painter, and I just love it because we got good, good data on what happens if growers get multiple pests? And so here's the cucumber beetle. So what did we look at? We looked at Movento, which is it's primarily one that's going to target aphids and white flies. Savanto, I just mentioned that insecticide. Belief, which is primarily an aphid material. Um, Arvanto, which is a new diamide, and then Warrior is your pyrethroid. So we we looked at these insecticides. There's your rates there. Um, typical. Uh, high rates for all these insecticides. And this is the number of cucumber beetles. So these are live cucumber beetles on the left column. And one thing I wanted to show you is, um, although, yeah, we, we had a significant re reduction with everything except belief and Movento, which actually didn't surprise us because those are primarily aphid materials. But it did show you that Harvanta and Savanto provided equal control of, of the, uh, cucumber beetles. You look to the right and you can see dead beetles, which are within a 12, uh, 12 uh, inch radius around the plant. And you can just see the dead beetles piling up just to give you confirmation that yes, the insecticide is killing these insects, killing these, these beetles. So what does this say? It says that Savanto and Harvanto are options for cucumber beetle control that you could replace a pyrethroid with. 
same trial. We got aphids in it, melon aphid outbreaks. And you can see um, pretty much everything providing very good control of the aphids except the pyrethroid. And not surprising because I've shown you this data before. We actually had a heck of a lot more aphids and then a complete um, outbreak of them by September with the pyrethroid spray. So all those actually provide very good control of aphids, Movento, Savanto, Belief, Arvanta. And then how about this insect, squash bugs, which can also come a little bit later. Um, you know, I was really wondering how much damage squash bugs do um, late in the season, but they actually do a lot of feeding on, on fruit. And they, they did a lot this past summer. We had uh, particularly um, squash trials that we had, zucchini. And man, they, there was actually some marks on that, on that fruit when the fruit kind of has an exudate that comes out of it after the piercing sucking stylets get, are, are removed from the plant. So these things could actually cause a pumpkin to get unmarketable. I didn't think it was true. I thought they were primarily just leaf feeders and causing leaf wilt, which they do do. But when they pile up on the fruit too, they're, they may affect its marketability. So again, another insect that we should probably be concerned with. Yeah, look at these numbers, R ridiculous numbers. Um, Sometimes you get some diseases that follow where the insects were feeding and you kind of inoculated a plant with them. So, um, yeah, when they get this bad, they, they should have been sprayed. If that's not obvious enough. So in 2016, we got squash bugs as well. And here's the same insecticides and it kind of gives you some data on, they also control squash bugs and you're not getting very good control with Movento or belief, but those were, um, Again, those were primarily for targeting aphids. And that the low rate of Savanto actually doesn't work as well as if you go higher if you want to get squash bugs. So ended up being a really good trial. That's why I wanted to show it. Um, it kind of answered a lot of the questions for those insecticides. Now moving on with um, something else to consider with spraying. And that is some of the work that James Wilson did as his, for his doctoral work was uh, working with this natural enemy, this egg parasitoid of squash bug, this Gryon pensylvanicum. It's a little tiny wasp. And yes, we have it big time in southwestern Virginia. It's a major contributor to keeping squash bug populations down. So we want that wasp in our fields. We don't want to kill it. We want it to do what it does. So what we looked at was how do some of these insecticides, do they do anything um, to to this parasitoid. So with the, these are adult parasitoid bioassays where we actually treated a leaf and we placed it in a vial with these adult wasps and then we assess mortality. And um, I guess the bottom line with this one, Warrior was highly toxic to the parasitic wasp. We, we kind of knew that. Um, and these other insecticides are a little bit less so, but that's Savanto. I want to point that out that, you know, this is one that really was killing all the pests, the cucumber beetles squash bugs, aphids, and it looks like it's pretty light on the parasitoid wasps as far as mortality. It's very similar to the control. So that's a really good sign. Um, and, you know, it might be an insecticide. If you're not already considering it, that really has got a lot of the boxes checked. Ashley, am I, am I still coming across okay or? Okay, thanks, James. Um, or, yeah, it's good. I couldn't find my unmute button, but yeah. Okay, I didn't know whether uh, as the worst would have been, I went through all that and I'd been off the internet for the last 30 minutes. So anyway, yeah. let's, uh, let's get into a pest that this is the one I wanted to talk about, which it's going on four years now. Um, so the first part of my career, I had never seen this insect. This is pickle worm. Um, and in the last four and five years, it seems to be showing up now, late summer. Um, and this is just the reason I hadn't seen it earlier in my career is because it's a, it's a tropical insect. It's not supposed to be here, um, but it does come up on some, some summer, uh, summer storm fronts and things like that that can blow these moths pretty good distances. And we seem to be getting it uh, time and time again. I think what's happening is it's Instead of overwintering in South Florida, where it's supposed to be overwintering, I think it's overwintering a little bit closer to us. Um, 
And because of that, we're in reach of some moths that can get blown up during the summertime. So anyway, this, this is the larval stage of the pickle worm and some of the damage it can go in and out, in and out of, of fruit like zucchini and pumpkins. <clears throat> and it is, there's a picture of the moth. It's about the size of a penny. I've got a um, slide later where I actually took a picture of a moth that, that we had uh, reared out from the squash that we got. And um, you can see the size of it. And, uh, we, you know, again, we're not going to get these till, if anything, July would be the earliest, um, but it would typically be a little bit later in the summer, August. And they will, once they get here, they will keep going until frost. So they will keep going through generations, laying more eggs and damaging, um, damaging squash, zucchini, and pumpkins until, until frost comes. So it's bad once it gets here, for sure. So this is the damage that it causes. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of growers are, have become familiar with this now, but you're looking for a really perfectly round hole that goes in um, a little bit smaller than a pencil diameter. And then a lot of times you'll see on the bottom, you see like some sawdust frass. That's, that's the poop from the caterpillar that, that comes out of the hole and kind of piles up on the outside of it. Sometimes that blows off or the, or the rain washes it off and you're not left there. But that perfectly round hole um, is usually a dead giveaway that that's pickle worm. It starts in the blossoms. That's where eggs are laid. And you'll often see blossoms showing that hole. And that's a good early indicator that you've got that thing in your field. So be on a lookout for that. Again, here's some tunneling. Um, once it gets in, it's, it's bad news that fruit's gonna rot. So um, don't have to belabor that any, anymore, but now, what can we do about it? Here's our, here's our problems. Um, one, pyrethroids work really well, but I've just given you some reasons why spraying regularly multiple times with pyrethroids, you're going to get that aphid outbreak very likely. So um, we've looked at some other insecticides. All of these listed provide very good control of, of the pickle worm. So there are some things that, like Carvanta, that actually controls aphids and but you might want to be going with pyrethroids because they're cheaper. So we've looked at this in a trial. We actually got a trial in 2020 on zucchini, um, the first trial ever we did on pickle worm. And you can see the, uh, especially looking at percentage of flowers that had those tunnel holes in them. And you can see all of the insecticides. This was just one spray, um, really reduced that tunnel damage. And then significantly so on the fruit. We had very few holes, if any, um, with any of these insecticides. So they're very, very susceptible to insecticides if you can get them out in a timely manner. Again, pyrethroids could cause that. So one option is to throw an aphicide in with the pyrethroid mix. And what do we mean by aphicides? There's some foliar neonicotinoids. There was a sale that I had brought up, a sale in Savanto, which have a little bit lower bee toxicity. Products like Fulfill, PQZ, Safina, Belief. We have a lot of really, really good aphicides. We've tested these for years and they all provide excellent control of aphids. You will not get the outbreak. Um, but another option is to just pick an insecticide that really can just do it all. Um, gets the pickle worm, could get some late season cucumber beetles, squash bugs, doesn't flare the aphids or controls them. And all of these insecticides kind of fit that bill. Um, indigo has actually got a pyrethroid with a neonicotinoid. That's why that one kind of gets everything. Um, and then Torac is kind of a newer insecticide, a little broad spectrum. Exorel is a diamide as well as Harvanta. So these are all ones that kind of have some broad pest spectrum and can get a lot of different things, um, a lot of different pests. I don't know why this is coming in one bit at a time, but, um, yeah, let me go back. All right, so another option is if pickle worm is our big concern, we probably, you may not be spraying, but you're worried. Um, you're worried about this insect. You, want, you don't want it to damage your pumpkins late. Um, can we do anything to kind of give us a forecast or, or knowledge of when, when to spray? Well, there's the moth. It's down on the bottom. You kind of get an idea of its size and it, the way it looks. So be on the lookout. They, once they come in the fields, they're gonna stay there. 
Um, you'll see them hiding on the foliage. Um, if you see that, that's the pickle worm moth. They're laying eggs. You're going to get pickle worm. So that's an indication that you might start your sprays um, for this insect. Again, it's not going to show up till probably late July. Um, and that July infestation, that's really in the eastern part of Virginia, southeastern. It's probably going to be later for us. Eggs are really, really hard to see. You kind of can see them there um, on the bottom right. And unfortunately, the, there's no way to monitor the moths with black light traps or pheromones. We, we can't, they don't come to black lights and there's no uh, commercial pheromone lore. So you're really stuck with um, kind of being on the lookout for the moths. So one thing that I'm looking at, um, as soon as I can get a student to possibly work on this is, can we come up with sampling programs that extension agents or IPM consultants or even the growers can can just use these as kind of an indicator of when pickle worm is gonna be problems. And I think looking for that hole in the flowers, coming up with a good sampling program, how many, how many flowers, how many blooms to, to look at um, and correlate that with, with infestations later. So that's some work that I'd like to work on, um, probably with a graduate student. And then also with Sean Boyle, you've seen him speak at some pumpkin meetings. One thing that Sean has noticed and has been confirmed with um, what we've read about pickle worm is that they strongly prefer the yellow summer squash. So if you have multiple cucurbits like we've had at Kentland Farm, if you're going to get them, you're going to get them in the yellow squash first or yellow squash may be the only thing that got them. And uh, so maybe you can plant some some yellow squash and kind of use that as a sentinel for um, one, you got some squash to eat. And then two, you're using it to kind of give you an indicator of they're here and I better, I better protect my pumpkins. So that's kind of going to be the program that we're going to, we're going to test out. Um, I need to find the right, the right student. Um, and I would love to work with, with a lot of the growers um, on this program. I'd like to do it on commercial farms and what I would really need is just some summer squash planted that we could kind of eyeball and use to scout. So yeah, that's, that's all I have. Some take home messages here. I won't, I won't read them, but you all can read them. Um, but I will open it up for, for questions. If we do have time, Ashley, I don't know if I've gone over or not. Yeah, I think we're all right. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask them or use the chat either way. No, no, no questions. Everyone's just digesting their food right now. I'm guessing, just like me, but <laughs> for dinner. But I guess I'll uh, I'll pass it on, James. I'm still going to be here. So if anyone comes up with another question after your talk, I'll I'll still be around. I'll just give you all my hard ones if that works okay. out. All right. <laughs> so I guess I'll stop sharing. Oh, I've got a new computer, so I have to give it permission here. Just a second. I was going to ask Tom if he had any uh, insight into any squash vine borer or anything like that this year. I remember an email going around. Has anybody else had any issues with squash vine borer? Doesn't yeah, seem I'd be like curious to know what the major pest problems were with insects this year. Quiet group. I know I had a lot of people ask about pickle worm. Um, so yeah, I'm sure I, some of these people had it, even though they're not saying. Ashley, I'm going to have to quick rejoin the meeting because of something. Sorry, I'll be right back. It's a computer setting. Okay, no problem. So we could talk about, you know, maybe Ashley, if we could go forward this year, um, and Joanne, I see you're on there. I don't know if any other extension agents um, might be on here, but. You know, I'd really like to try this out on some on some pumpkin fields, the scouting for for the pickle worm. Um, 
I mean, we've gotten it about four years straight now. So it looks like it's something that we're going to be dealing with. Um, so I would love to come there and, you know, it would just be organizing with having some, some yellow squash planted that we could come and kind of use that as a sentinel, but also look, look on the blooms in the, uh, in the pumpkin field. So if you all want to start lining up potentially some growers, um, and we will revisit this come, come summertime. Um, but I'll, I'll send a reminder before that, but I, I definitely want to get, get started on this, start seeing whether it'll work. Yeah, I definitely would be interested. And if anyone on here that is um, one of my local people or is interested in collaborating, just let me know. I too would be interested. No, I think I've got a producer that would be more than willing to do that. Okay, sounds good. All right, James, go ahead. Great. Thank you. I'm uh, having the new computer was. It's nice problems to have. So, yeah, I'm James Wilson. It's my pleasure to be meeting with you all again. I'm over here looking at two different screens. I hope you don't mind. Um, and I'm here to talk about pollinators and pumpkin and not talk about most of my PhD stuff that Tom just talked about. Thank you, Tom. That was nice to see those data again. I am here to talk about the Virginia Managed Pollinator Protection Plan. It's something I mentioned uh, last year in 2020. And I'm gonna get into Field Watch and BCheck, just give you a little bit of an update about that and uh, give you a cutting edge update about pesticide fate in beehives, since that's something we have to talk about when we're managing and doing IPM. Uh, there's a new paper that came out. It's not even fully available yet, but I already stole a figure from it. And then uh, we're going to talk about pollinators and pumpkin, of course, uh, see if you all have any issues. Uh, remind you of this research that I introduced last year about uh, uh, some pumpkin research that came out of Pennsylvania. And that's really going to set the stage for me to introduce Courtney Walls, our new graduate student, to you. So let's get started. Uh, talked about the Virginia um, Virginia's voluntary plan to mitigate the risk of pesticides to manage pollinators. And the way VDAX set this up and they, they worked closely with a lot of different stakeholders, growers and beekeepers included, was to try and figure out uh, a regulatory way because it is VDAX to go ahead and figure out how to um, help out and mitigate some of these issues. So really they were concentrating on the applicator and the beekeeper and how those two can effectively communicate better to avoid some mishaps assuming that nobody is really out there trying to kill bees, which makes sense, especially to you all, since you are working in a uh, pollination dependent crop system. So they're part of your tools. Um, the EPA put out some new labeling on restricted use pesticides that are highly toxic to bees, and they now have a new bee label warning. Uh, this should be out. You should be seeing this, especially on some of the products that Tom listed um, that are running kind of hot and do have higher toxicity for bees. So one of the tools that VDAX has bought into is uh, this bee check program over here. And this is where the beekeepers can go in and register their location and their hives and say, please, here's my contact information. Let me know if uh, you're going to be spraying nearby and we can work something out and figure out a, a good way to avoid some mishaps. And so there's a lot of partner states here that have been joining in in that and adopting that program. And so for applicators, there's the field check program, and that's where you can go in and register as an applicator if you're doing work outside of your own uh, area. Just to give you an idea what that looks like, I pulled this up earlier today. Um, I tried to make sure I got all the way from Abingdon up here to Stanton to cover a few people. My screen is only so big and you can only see so many things, so I didn't get all of Virginia. But there are quite a few uh, beehives registered, and uh, we can definitely see that uh, if you click on any one of these, you can get access to the information there and uh, contact them. And if you go to a close up view of one of those, you would see as an applicator, if you clicked on one of these hives over here, you'd be able to get the contact information from this made up little person over here and contact them, find out you know what kind of uh, purpose they have for having their bees there and uh, what's going on with the bees. Uh, in this one, it's uh, there's honeybees there, similar in colony, and uh, it's gonna be permanent for the season, just to give you an idea. Um, this is mainly gonna be for big commercial uh, applicators, but maybe this could help us out if there's a mishap every now and then. So for the beekeeper, they're gonna be uh, locating their individual hives. They're gonna be setting up sort of a buffer uh, of like maybe a half acre, depending on state uh, guidelines to say, hey, please avoid at least in this area, but uh, 
we're always thinking about things like drift and other types of exposure. So this brand new study that came out uh, is looking at the pesticide in, this is their actual title, Pesticides in Honeybee Colonies, Establishing a Baseline for Real World Exposure Over Seven Years in the United States. I've not had the chance to dive into this because it's not fully available. But this is a pre-proof um, and is particularly encouraging. Uh, they were able to recover out of these uh, 218 different pesticides and their metabolites, over a thousand different apiaries. They were able to pick up around 120 different residues. And the vast majority of those being 41%, the very tools that beekeepers are using and putting inside their hives to protect their bees from varo varroa mites. That's this little uh, evil looking brown thing right here. It's a parasite. If I were to have a parasite that big, it'd be like me having a Frisbee on my side sucking the life out of me. And that's definitely the number one pest we have in honeybees. Um, so it's good news that that's, that's what's really showing up. It's not good that it's definitely showing up though. Well, we can see here that there are some other insecticides showing up, accounting for 21% of what is able to, been, to have been recovered. Uh, that means that there are agricultural uh, protectants and pesticides that are getting in. And in that, we can also see that there are fungicides and herbicides getting in. I, I bring this to your attention, uh, not to say it's okay, just keep blasting everything, but to, instead to say that we are picking up pesticides inside the hives. It's not an alarming amount, and we're not finding... Uh, huge hazardous amounts like we were talking about some of the B-tox when uh, Tom was talking about specific classes of insecticides, but we are picking it up. And we are interestingly enough picking up fungicides. And I know that uh, cucurbit production is heavily reliant on fungicides. And unfortunately, uh, some of the research is trending towards that might have some impacts on the, the microbiome and the gut flora of the bees that might have some long-term uh, social immunity issues and might not be helping out with a lot of these other larger risks that uh, have been pointed out by this paper. So just a heads up on that. Um, I want to put that in context for you. Uh, I help contribute on the B section to uh, this and the other pest management guides. Thanks to Tom for roughing me in on that and keeping me relevant. Uh, I try to help out with a little section up front about protecting pollinators, and then uh, we'll review the types of insecticides that are in there and try to make sure that we have up-to-date information about their toxicity of bees and allow you to be able to make uh, very informed decisions. So these are available online at pubs.ext.vt.edu. So we have pest management guides like this. We have pest profiles. I saw that Tom redid one that uh, he and I worked on together on cucumber beetle not too long ago. Uh, there's things like that all over the place in there. There are beekeeping pests too that we are highlighting. Courtney is currently working on one. And uh, there's also some common insect ID fact sheets, which is good because since I'm a bee guy, you might be asking me about this. Uh, we've definitely had to think about uh, this giant Asian hornet or Asian giant hornet. Uh, you all may have heard about it in the news called the uh, murder hornet. No, we do not have it here in Virginia. We do not expect it here in Virginia. It's not even been on this coast. We do have European hornets. Um, and so you can dive into this and you can see that there's definitely a description about the European hornet and to give you an idea of what it is. Uh, beekeepers are worried about this because in Asia, this is definitely a pest of beehives, but we do not have that here. And there's some X-Files looking footage of some workers, APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service workers removing uh, a nest that they found in Washington state, but it's not been recovered outside of there yet. So you can uh, check into the entomology department if you'd like for some of that information, but you can also find some nice leads and free information on the extension website there. So uh, I just want to quick take the opportunity. I know not everybody can raise their hand, but please, um, if you have any issues going on with pollination right now, uh, let me know, I'm kind of curious. So uh, some people, are renting bee colonies. I imagine that people still are. I saw it out there in the 2020 field season and that's good to hear. I wanted to know if folks were having issues, again, getting pollination in the middle of their field or uh, are there any misshapen pumpkins or low numbers or issues with small size and weight? Those can all be attributed to potentially some issues going on with pollination. And it could be that there was a thunderstorm that rolled up and when all that fruit was about to set and it prevented these bees from being able to get in there and, and get to the pollination, um, or it could be that there were some other issues. So if you are having these issues, please look me up. My email is keepbees at vt.edu. Um, that's the best way to get a hold of me right now because I'm in the bees and teaching all the time. 
And uh, hopefully I can help you figure that out. And if you're curious about bees, are you finding bees in your plants? That's one of the best ways to figure out what's going on. So just a quick quiz. Um, this is the European honeybee. It's nice and hairy. It has all kinds of hairs all over it to allow it to uh, catch on to and control pollen so it can take it back to the hive and feed it to its young, to the larvae, and uh, it can build a colony from there to be able to help us out. So there are other bees out there for sure in our pumpkins. Um, this is not a pumpkin. This is actually a cucumis flower, one of Tom's, but we can see here that uh, that this little honeybee is getting to work and she's got pollen all over her baskets and she's doing a great deal of pollination for us. But we have some other bees at play. We have squash bees here and here's Tom's favorite cucumber beetle over here to the side. So we know he has some others and that's actually, a, I believe, a male and a female in here. Um, we also have some bumblebees that we need to be thinking about. I bring this to your attention because there are several different types of life cycles involved in these bees. You know, the honeybee colony, we can drop down at the beginning of the field season and, and put it on the side of the field. And we can have thousands of foragers emerge every single day to go out and find the flowers. And in the, their efforts to go get nectar and pollen, they end up performing pollination services. We can also buy colonies of bumblebees, but we also have native colonies of bumblebees. They start out with queen one, and she builds up her colony slowly throughout the year. So it's a different cycle. And when we talk about our squash bees, we have one mom who digs underneath our plants and ends up uh, collecting a whole bunch of pollen, making it into a ball, laying one egg in there, and then starting all over again and going to work from there and there and there. So there's much different life cycles. We do have these two, at least two soil nesting bees that are doing a lot of work. And so uh, I think we're probably seeing some side effects of our uh, no-till adoption, where a lot of you are, are using no-till practices or uh, reduced tillage practices in your production. And that's likely going to be having some benefit to these soil nesting bees where we're less likely to disturb them at the beginning of the year when they're very sensitive and waiting to get a start in the spring. So I just wanted to point out and remind you of this paper that uh, I found last year from Penn State looking at pumpkins specifically. And uh, what they found was there's some basic groups of bees. And so uh, in a survey to see who was there, they found that 54% of the bees were that were doing the work were there were bumblebees. And then second to that was our honeybees. And third to that was our squash bee. And so this seemed like a, a good, good idea to see how Virginia might compare to this. So there was 37 different species of bee that they found in cucurbits. So that's interesting, or excuse me, just in pumpkins. So uh, if we get down to the numbers, we can see that honeybees need to visit uh, pumpkin flowers around 16 times to get adequate pollination. A bumblebee is larger, it's furrier in a different kind of way. Um, it can get the job done in four to eight visits. And a squash bee, co-evolved with these plants, is uh, only needs eight vis visits. So that means that they need to show up this time frame. So what they found was uh, a bee was showing up every one minute, or excuse me, a honeybee was showing up every one minute and 36 seconds. Bumblebees every two minutes and 21 seconds, and squash bees every eight minutes, 52 seconds. So that's definitely ahead of what they were saying they needed. So that was 20 times the type of pollination or the amount they needed for pollination. So there's a lot of bees out there in this field site that they, in these field sites that they used up in Pennsylvania. So we were definitely interested in that. Um, so Based on their data, honeybees might not be needed. There might be a lot of native pollinators already doing the work, and they might even be more efficient from that. And they were concerned about what's going on uh, with these bees in their distance from the edge of the field. And so far from you all, I have not heard similar concerns. So that's kind of interesting to us. So I'm going to pause there because I wanted to set this up for Courtney. Uh, Courtney's on here with us tonight. She is uh, a former founding member and president of the Beekeepers of Virginia Tech, as she did for her undergrad. She is a Virginia beekeeper herself. She is a fantastic help in the bee lab. It's been my pleasure to have her around both as an undergraduate and now as a graduate student. And she's here to help us learn about pollination and pumpkins. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing now. And Courtney, hopefully you are ready to share. Great. And I'll be quiet. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. 
So as James mentioned, I did my undergrad at Virginia Tech and I got my bachelor's degree in crop and soil science and graduated in the spring of 2020. And I'm currently a master's student in entomology looking at pollination and pumpkins. In Virginia, as I'm sure you guys know, and a tribute to the $16.4 million of value added that it adds to our economy from pumpkins and the approximate 1 million that it comes from squash, we use both managed and unmanaged pollinators in this cropping system in order to make viable fruit. And our goal of this project is really to understand what we, who are we managing for and who's out there in the field pollinating these pumpkins. So in our field research, we wanted to find, of course, who is in the field making these viable fruits. And then we wanted to know the best way to be able to find who is in the field. So we use three different methods within our field system. Uh, we looked at both pumpkins and squash. We looked at a 30 acre pumpkin farm in Reiner, Virginia, which is by uh, Dan Brandt and Chuck King. And we looked at their pumpkins of Kratos, Mystic Plus, and Magic Wand. They're on a irrigated system and working with a no-till program while our quarter acre squash field was in Whitethorn, Virginia, and it is a small plot research with Lioness Summer Squash. The three methods that we use for observation in the field this summer were visual observation, vacuum sampling, and bee bowls. And to go into a little bit more about these methods, um, during all these methods, we sampled during peak bloom of the pumpkins and squash. We sampled when it was sunny, it was good flying conditions for bees, and it was above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. We used 15 meter long plot rows and then three rows for each method of observation. Visual observations started at 7 a.m every morning that we started and went until the flowers closed, which we found was often before 10 a.m. The observer would look at one meter squared of a plot row and watch that until we had completed five sections each and we had three observers, so it was our 15 meter length row. The bees were recorded and we captured ones that represented if we could identify them on spot, then we didn't capture more bees than what we needed to. For our vacuum sampling, we used a 15 meter row plot again. We vacuumed every single flower within that row. And then we took the bees back on ice and pinned them later for identification. But we found that this method was sometimes a little um, dependent on the flower opening themselves. So we made a guard to prevent any damaging to the flowers as well. And our final method was bee bowls, where we used blue, yellow, and white bee bowls in order to collect the bees out of the field. This is a passive method of collecting the bees. So we set them out for 48 hours and then returned to collect the bees that were collected. We collected them by just putting soapy water in the pan and then the bees would fly over, visually see them, and then drop down into the pan. So while we collected these bees, we used nine different categories of classification. And this was just mainly for our visual observations, although we use it in the rest of the methods as well. This is so we could ID them on spot as they were flying in and out of the flowers. We used honeybees, bumblebees, squash bees, small black bees, large black bees, small striped bees, large striped bees, green bees, and others. And we modeled this after the study that James just talked about in Pennsylvania. So our results from this summer for the pumpkins, and this is just our preliminary data from one field season. 
we saw about 230 squash bees in our pumpkins and a little over 100 small black bees with only about 75 honeybees. Most of our bees were collected in the field through visual observations, which means we didn't actually collect most of them. We only collected representative samples when needed. And we used the bee bowls as well. There was 483 bees collected out of our pumpkin sites and we measured them for three days. In our summer squash, we saw about the same thing. We saw in bee morphotaxa groups, we saw that over 400 squash bees, uh, the next highest was small black bee again. And then surprisingly, we saw no honeybees in our two days of observation. However, we collected 520 bee specimens through our squash plants. So our takeaway here is that the squash bees for our preliminary field season of data, our squash bees were our number one taxa in the field, which was very surprising. We based it off of previous studies in Virginia and in Pennsylvania, and it was not what we expected. And in the future, we hope to see if that was maybe an anomaly this field season, or maybe if it'll change in the coming field season as we look into the summer of 2021. And most of our bees were collected through visual observations, which was also a nice sign because that can be replicated through field scouting as well if you're interested to maybe see who would be in your field possibly. So thank you to Brand King Farms for letting us use their pumpkin field as well. Um, but if you have any questions, <laughs> I can give it back to James as well. Great. Thank you, Courtney. We can see uh, Dan Brand giving some pumpkins or presenting pumpkins to the governor. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to stop. Sharing. So I, I forgot to mention uh, uh, that. Uh, Courtney is working with both Tom and I, uh, care of a uh, Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Grant, uh, working in the squash system. And also we're taking that opportunity to do some good work in the rest of the cucurbits. And so thank you, Tom, for approaching me to that opportunity. And thank you, Courtney, for taking me up on it. Happy to have you on board. So uh, one day I felt like it was this summer, it was my job just to be the camera guy while Courtney's out there doing all the hard work. I also tried to measure and help out. But uh, I just want to show you what's going on. Courtney mentioned that uh, we did very well in recovering the types of bees that were there over time, just using some visual observations. So I wanted to show you something that might be kind of interesting. And maybe this would be a good trivia question. If, see if Tom can tell me what's going on here. Oh, I went backwards one. I don't know if you can hear these bees or not. These are all squash bees. So the question is, are they doing a whole, bu whole bunch of pollination? And if memory serves me well, this should be a male flower being up so high from uh, the plant here, but still these bees are going and coming to it. If you were to look at this, you would say, wow, I have so many bees. This is gonna be fantastic. I'm gonna get all the pollination I need. But what's going on here is this is uh, a mating game. There are a whole bunch of male bees here attracted to the female bees. So while yes, there are a lot of bees and that might be indicative of showing us how many bees we actually have in the field, there's only a couple of ladies in here doing the real work. The males are just there for the ladies. So this is on the edge. What we found was um, that on the edge, kind of up high on a hill, uh, we were more likely to see this. So maybe we'll do a little spin-off objective and see if there's some preference for where they mate, because then we would not avoid that when we scout. It might give us a, a false high number. All right, well, that's enough time for you all to see that in a row. But yeah, they're up there. Uh, doing some serious work before seven o'clock in the morning. That's why we had to make sure we were there and ready. And these native bees, because they're nesting there in that soil, then they don't have very far to go. They can get there while that pollen is still very, very viable. What I didn't tell you is this is maybe 150 yards from about a dozen strong honeybee colonies. They're not there this morning, but these squash bees are there. There we go. So, uh, 
like I said, it was my job to be out there with the camera. We've got Courtney working over here. We've got Lexi working over here. And it was really hard work because, you know, it's just kind of gloom and doom when you're out there seeing these nice, pretty pumpkins. But it was it was great to be out there. Um, so I'm going to pause right there and, and be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Courtney's still here and Tom is still here. We're happy to field questions. Thank you all for having us. So uh, I see that Rachel has a question on here. Is there anything growers can do to help increase the squash bee population? Uh, right now, it seems like uh, paying attention and adopting or uh, thinking about some of these no-till practices and how that might help um, preventing the disturbance of their nesting from one year to another seems to be pretty good. Um, but we're going to look more into it and see if we can't come up with some Virginia-specific recommendations uh, I, it seems like this has changed around significantly from what we've seen in other papers coming out of Virginia. So it could be with this more recent adoption of no-till that we could be seeing a sort of a resurgence of this, uh, of this bee, which is great. Normally you use the word resurgence to talk about a pest. <laughs> Excuse me, are there any other questions? Yeah, there's ones. Okay. Uh, Nathan wants to know how concerned am I with the negative effects of fungicide on bees? Uh, they lost a keeper that they rented from a few years ago due to this concern. Um, there are some studies out there that are showing that uh, we're basically sort of overs often we are running the risk of oversimplifying the uh, gut flora and gut biome of the bee. And if we do that, then we sort of everybody knows that diversity is the spice of life. If we reduce it, then there could be one type of bacteria that could be more prevalent than the other, and it might not um, be as stable for them of an environment. So uh, there are some concerns. For us, it's kind of interesting. We are talking about in Virginia, a local renting situation in most cases where a beekeeper is only gonna be, be moving a few miles, maybe 50 miles, something like that. Um, the rest of the country though, we're seeing close to 70% of all managed bees being trucked all the way out to California for almond uh, pollination. And we see similar things there. Where we're worried about some of these fungicides. And so that's really what's driving a lot of this data, um, search, the search for these data to see what's going on inside there. And there can, the challenge is that, okay, it might throw off their guts a little bit, but they can still work. They can still do what they need to, but it might reduce some of their abilities to detoxify what else is going on, what else they might be encountering. So we could see it sort of uh, make them less stable and less likely in the future to be able to uh, handle um, a sublethal effect from a different type of uh, toxicity. So right now I'm in the process of writing this grant that uh, I'm going to throw Tom's name on too, where we're going to be looking at some of these interactions in uh, self-pollinated crop systems. So we've got some row crops that we definitely grow that we do not need bees for, but bees are there foraging. So we want to check out and make sure that we're being safe with those. Uh, and we're going to do the same thing for ornamentals. So I'm roping in two other in, uh, entomologists from our uh, Agriculture Research and Extension Centers, the Tidewater AREC and the Hampton Roads AREC and involve them in this process. And we're gonna do a review and try and just be, uh, we're gonna review our own best management practices and try and avoid some of these things up front. So I have some concern. I'm not raising all the red flags yet, but I, I wanna learn more and uh, I hope to be able to, to share that with you so we can all stay ahead of this. And Tom said I could use all his vegetables, so that works out. Thank you, Nathan. Are there any other questions? And um, Tom, I think, yeah, Tom's still on too. So if there are any questions related to other insects, you can ask those now too. And of course, if, if you don't have any right now, but you have something that comes up later that you wanna ask, you can, um, Either, I'm sure they wouldn't mind, but you can ask me or your local extension agent and we'll forward those on and um, make sure that we get all of your questions answered. And uh, I'm also going to be posting this on my YouTube again. So if um, you wanted to go back and relook at any of the slides or um, had any questions, you, maybe something you missed, you want to revisit, it'll be there for you to look at as well. So. Well, um, I want to say thank you again to everybody for, for joining us. Um, we do have one more question. I think, where can you source Savanto? Yeah, it's a very good, very good question. It's a, it's a bear crop science 
insecticide that's the manufacturer and i think you know wherever you're wherever you get your chemicals from southern states or or whatever um i'm sure bear supplies them and you know it would just be a matter of making sure that the that the sales rep um gets some of that chemical there if they don't have it already so hopefully that'll help you you know it's a it's a bear product and you know, I would contact the southern states or wherever it is that you're getting them and just say, um, can we get some? Can we get some in? So, and I can't tell you anything about the cost. If that's the follow-up question. So <laughs> I don't get into that. There's another question in the chat too about pickle worm. Are there any systemics that can be applied earlier in the growing season? You know, that's a really good question. Um, Corrigin is, you know, if, if it can go, um, you know, I hadn't thought about that. It, it, it's going to be mainly attacking the reproductive structures of the plant, which a lot of times the systemic insecticides, they're not going to, they're not going to move into the reproductive, the flowers and the, and the fruit. Um, and that might be the concern with something like Corrigin, but Boy, that would actually be worth doing a trial, um, you know, particularly that insecticide, because um, it's it's very systemic and very very um, very very efficacious on on the lepidopter and like like pickle worm. Um, that's I don't think it's going to be great for that because I don't because I think you really need to target it to protect the fruit and the flowers. But I don't know if I've seen any data where anyone is actually tested that so um thanks for the idea i if we can get another uh get another trial where we can get pickle worm um that that would be worth and i could also look around and see whether anyone has has actually tried that but the i i, I see the admire in there um the neonicotinoids aren't going to get pickle worm so admire or any of the others um that's not going to get them but corrigin that that's got some possibilities here. So um, thanks for the thanks for the idea, the suggestion. Did you see the okay, comment on like, Harvanta? Yeah, it looked like someone's someone's tried Harvanta already. So thank you, Bethany, for the, the feedback on that. Um, I'll actually uh, I think the company that's selling that now, is it um soon? They passed it on to another company. It was, um, Summit Summit Agro or Sum. Anyway, there's like a second hand that's now marketing that Harvanta. If, if someone's someone's interested in that, Summa. Got it. Why can't I not think of the name of this? It's Summit Agro USA. Okay, that's it. Thank you, James. Um, so yeah, they have they have the Harvanta now. Um, it was an ISK insecticide before, like a year ago, but. Um, they would be very interested in that information that, um, you know, it seemed to help against pickle worm. So yeah, Lambda, uh, the, the pyrethroids do work well too against pickle worm. So um, I agree. I, I think it's, I don't think it's hard. I think it's just timing. You get, you get, you get any of these insecticides down when they're, before they get into the fruit, um, the, it's it's definitely going to help. All right, last call. <laughs> and if, um, like I said, if there aren't any other questions, would you come up with something later? Just let me know, and we'll get back to you. So. Hmm. Thanks to all our speakers for your time. I know we're all getting kind of zoomed out. So I really appreciate your willingness to do this for everybody. So, um, and I do want to mention again, we're going to be talking about weeds this coming Thursday night. Um, so if you're able to join us again, uh, be glad to have you. And thank you all for your time this evening. Thank yeah, you. Th thanks for organizing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Good night.